Today, I want to talk about whether how to become an FEA analyst and is it even worth it? And that's an interesting topic. I, I wanted to start something with something that I feel strongly about because this way it's easier and obviously I'm nervous. So the start will be awkward, let's say. But uh, I want to begin with the, the second part of the question. So is it even worth it to be an FEA analyst? Is it fun? And, you know, do you like the lifestyle? all that stuff. So I would start with the fact that being working with FEA is a job like any other. So there are good and bad positions. And whatever field you work, it's obvious that at least one company in the world gives you like super cool experience and work. And then uh, on the other hand, like even in the best field, there will be a company that will make your life miserable. Right. So uh, obviously, there is a scale and there is not an obvious answer. However, I can tell you from my experience what I think about the whole thing. So uh, I would say that FEA is fun and I do it for a living. So obviously, I'm biased. Uh, but you kind of like you came, right? So I guess that you're biased as well. So let's just set it that FEA is fun. Uh, however, I would also note that FEA is fun to some degree in some places. I mean, I would really strongly encourage you, if you work in FEA, to actually work in a place that allows you to do the whole project, uh, or at least take some part in it. Uh, I know from my blog that several people wrote me already that all they do in their work is, for instance, meshing. And they, they, they aren't even told what they are meshing for. They just do mesh. In, in such case, that wouldn't be a very cool experience to have for like two decades in a row, let's say. So definitely, I would say that FEA is way better if you can actually participate in a project from start to finish. And many companies, including big companies, actually allow you to do so. Uh, and that's awesome. If you work in a company where you have to do only one part, at least be interested in what is going on, like what happens before your work, what happens after your work, because then uh, it allows you to expand and have a bigger skill set. Because I think that in FEA, what is important is to be able to solve the problem from start to finish, because this will eventually lead to a situation when you will become very good at it. And that's what I would aim for. This is what FEA, this is why FEA is so cool. I, I really consider FEA to be magic. Like I wouldn't limit myself. If, if someone gave me the ability to cast spells, like I definitely wouldn't limit myself. I will test everything I could and see what the potential is, what I can achieve, how to achieve it. So definitely doing projects from start to finish really help you out. And if you do that, and if you do it long enough, you become an expert. And I feel that when you are like really good at some niche, then it's better to be like independent, have your own company. But of course, many people work in huge companies and they are experts within a company, you know, responsible for something very specific. And if you manage to get an expert status, uh, this is when FEA becomes incredible. Like it's so much fun to do FEA. Because, look, first of all, you can really solve very difficult problems. And if you can solve very difficult problems, not only you get the satisfaction and occasional praise from customers, you also earn really good money doing so. So the more complex and the more difficult problems you can solve, the better. And also work becomes challenging and it's fun, it's motivating. And I really like what I do. So waking up in the morning and going to the office and when you know that you'll have to do something in FEA, it's, it's actually cool most of the time. So, uh, well, definitely I couldn't be a like, you know, primary school teacher or anything. So FEA is definitely better than that, at least in my opinion. And also when you become very good at it, uh, the freedom you get is intense. And it doesn't even matter if you're like a company expert, even though this can be limiting to some degree if you are needed in place, but definitely it's the case when you have your own company. If you can buy a laptop, and obviously you can, you can actually work whenever you like. And that's also like a huge benefit. And actually we 
have like my entire team we have laptops and we compute on our like you know uh, machines that we can carry with us and i aim for us to work in restaurants which apparently made us pretty resilient to the whole pandemic thing because we are already set up to work remotely uh, this is not exactly what i have in mind and i don't feel that that you know being <laughs> resistant to pandemic in organizational way is such a huge benefit it, it just so happened that uh, right now we are in a place where this has a huge utility but normally what i love about fea is that you can basically travel wherever you like and have your few own favorite coffee shops and you know drink coffee and, and work whenever you like so that's that's super cool but i think that the biggest benefit you get in working with fea is the fact that it literally is unlimited. By this I mean uh, you can always learn something new. There is a huge benefit in deepening your knowledge in any given field, but the deeper you go, the less practical things become. I mean, you can be such a huge expert in any one field that most of you, what you know, will be more or less useless. Like it's deepen your knowledge, it helps you with understanding stuff. To some degree, you will never use it in a normal industrial designs because, like, you know, industry go the other way and not everybody is, like, super expert in a given field, right? So the, the deeper you go, uh, the less often you get to use your knowledge. Like, you can be a super expert in shell stability, for instance. And, like, I know things I will never use. Mostly because, like, you know, I understand them and they never happen in actual design, right? But with FEA, the cool part is that it's also very wide. So you don't have to only go deep. Like if I want to learn something new, instead of doing, I don't know, pressure vessels, I can say, okay, let's design a ship and I can learn everything there is to learn in that industry. And you can literally skip from one place to another. So this also means that if one industry gets really hit hard by economy for whatever reason, you can actually switch gears and do something else. And I know that to some of you, this may seem weird because no, but normally people don't switch careers. But to be fair, I already did that once. And I do more mechanical than civil design, right, designs right now in FEA. The truth is that if you become good enough with the tool, people in various industries will be interested in working with you, mostly because you know how to solve stuff. And sure, you may not know this regulation or that regulation in a given industry, but there are many people that do, but not many people know FEA on a good enough level to actually solve a complex problem. So you become very important to many places. And this also means that you have a relatively secure job and a stable situation and econ economically speaking, because let's face it, if entire economy collapses, we are all done. And most likely that won't, it won't happen. Something will be standing and you will be useful in that industry. So that's a huge benefit as well. And there is always something new. Like um, I already switch what I do once because I begin my career as a typical uh, civil engineer doing like industrial steel structure designs. And after several years, uh, it simply started to be tiring for me. You know, constantly all the same things all the time. and FEA allows you to do really, really weird stuff. Like the weirdest stuff I was involved in. Uh, one time, an orthodontist asked me how to calculate teeth with FEA because they needed uh, something for like braces. So it's all doable. And like, you know, you can basically switch and, and do whatever. And that's cool. But of course, working with FEA is not only benefits. There are not so cool things as well. Uh, I would say that FE work, especially on a higher level, uh, gets pretty weird working hours. Like when I do computing and I have a relatively big model, it will calculate for let's say eight hours, maybe five. So when I start and launch the analysis, like let's say just before I go home, I will take my laptop with me. And then somewhere during the late evening, the analysis will be done. And it would be great to say, okay, I will just sleep on it and then wake up and, and run another FEA analysis later. But reality is that sometimes, or maybe even oftentimes, you need to deliver outcomes in a given time. So you simply sit during the night waiting for the analysis to compute. 
So you can save the outcomes, see what is going on, make a call what to analyze next, press play, and then go to sleep. So it kind of like gives you a lot of space in between where, you know, the computing is happening. And if you ha don't have any other model to, to build, you basically read books, blog, <laughs> or do other stuff. But uh, you need to be ready that from time to time, in really weird hours, you will have to work. And this also includes weekends. Like, I usually tell my customers that, look, uh, I can deliver this in five days as long as we start um, on Tuesday, because then after four days of modeling and setting up the, the model, I have the weekend to run the analysis. So I need to be home at least every few hours and see what's going on, make the decision what to analyze next, and um, put the next analysis uh, to to be done. So this means that I'm working on weekends in some sense. Sure, not, not a lot, but you know, my wife never is happy about that because it's hard to plan like a two day family trip when every five hours I need to sit for half an hour and do something. So it's, it's definitely, uh, definitely a problem. And also it tends to be stressful uh, and it's stressful uh, to, in, in two ways. The first one is, FEA is often used for a very difficult problems. Like, come on, uh, if someone can do by hand calculations and come out with a decent outcome, they would never hire you. Like the salary for do FEA is relatively high, but also it takes a lot of time. And if someone can get just as good outcome in five minutes, this is not job for FEA. So uh, you basically will solve very difficult problems. And of course, those are usually not very well defined. There are problems within understanding what is there to be done. Because it's not only how to set up model, it's like what to model, what should be there, what shouldn't, what can I avoid, and, and stuff like that. So it's a very responsible job. And usually in FEA, you calculate very important details, like things that matter. Actually, you, if, if you do something wrong and this thing fails, a big catastrophe can happen. So it's stressful, but it's also stressful on an organizational level, let's say. Uh, if you do a simple FEA job, I hate those. <laughs> like, um, and someone says, will you deliver the design in a week? And you should like, sure, I, I can do that. So you start analyzing the problem and suddenly you realize that the contact in your model won't converge because whatever. Right? And you see it one day, two days, sometimes three weeks, fighting to converge the model that technically should work. Every other model works. This one just doesn't. And it happens all the time. Like, I mean, I've been doing FEA for like, what, 10 years, and I have a PhD in the field. And out of every 20 projects, one gets this one freaking analysis that you simply cannot converge for whatever reason. Like, and you never know. <laughs> of course, I, I do admit that while... I do not know what I'm doing differently. The amount of non-converged analysis decreases in time. Five years ago, every second analysis did not converge, and I didn't know why. I still don't know why they didn't work, but now only every 20th analysis don't converge. So subconsciously, I've learned some tricks, and I'm using them, not even thinking, thinking about them, because I did a lot of them simply. So this is a problem that in time, I hope, will completely disappear or at least to some degree. So experience really helps. But I always have to tell my customers, look, the delivery time is a week. But if I happen to have issues with model convergence for whatever reason, I will let you know because in that case, I will work day and night to fix it, sure. But I cannot promise you 100% that it will be done in like to this hour on this day. Unless, of course, this is a, like something I did hundreds of times before, and usually that's not the case. Because if the model won't converge, then I will have to work on it. So it's also difficult in that, uh, in that regard. But all in all, I would say that being an expert and having this freedom to do whatever you like, whenever you like, is well worth the risks and the hassle. Sure, you can get used to being doing very responsible things, and uh, I don't think about them all that much. Like a few years back, I, I would lose sleep from time to time because the job was stressful, and I feel that I simply believe in my skills more and I understand more. 
So if you're constantly developing, this gets way easier. Uh, so all in all, uh, FEA, I would say, is a great field. And my wife is an IT specialist. So, you know, being in IT sector is great. But I had a chat with her yesterday, and she told me that FEA actually promises more in terms of being an expert and uh, developing your company, for instance, or your expertise, mostly because in IT, you need to have a relatively big team to accomplish something. So if you're like a super good IT specialist and you want to have a company, you still need to hire a lot of people to deliver whatever you want to sell. In FEA, I hire only two people. We can calculate whatever we like. Like we, you, oftentimes we run several projects in parallel because like one person to one project, more or less. So it's an expert job that pays very well and doesn't require you to have like a huge company. And that's, that's great. But to me personally, the best benefit is that you can always learn. And I strongly believe that with constant learning, you just become better and better. And your position in job market and in industry in general becomes better. So uh, I would say that uh, that would be a pretty neat place to be. And sure, like I know that I will learn till I get retired and most likely longer because I simply enjoy it. Uh, and there is a lot of other things that I will learn in future, but also the things that I already know uh, makes me confident in my future. So I feel secure even like, you know, in the world around us when so much crazy things happen right now. Uh, I'm not very worried. And this, this feeling is a very nice benefit of working in the field. And I would associate it with, you know, having a company, of course, that is successful, sure. But I think that FEA actually allows you to launch a business that will be fairly successful, relatively easy. Like, it's definitely better than, you know, starting a restaurant or something like that. So that would be what I think about, is it worth it to, uh, to be in an FEA field? And if I would have to give one word, yeah, definitely. So how do you become an FEA analyst? Uh, well, I started like everybody else. And I think one big thing should be said up front. And that is, it's like with journalism. My, my friend is a journalist. And he told me, look, you can study journalism at university, but this wouldn't make you a good journalist. First of all, you need to be a journalist in a given field. And you need to be very good at that field. So he actually studied politics and political science, and then he became a journalist in the field because he understood the field. With FEA, it's something like that. You try to solve complex problems. And sure, FEA is a very complex tool that you're using, and it requires a lot of knowledge about FEA itself. But definitely, you need to also know what you are trying to do in general. So if you're like a huge FEA geek, you know how to operate every software, you understand all mathematics and whatever, but you're a poor engineer, so you don't understand how structure works and stuff like that, you would be a rather weak FEA specialist. Because like while you can do a lot, sure, it would be very difficult to actually produce any reasonable outcomes. So I would say that before diving deep into FEA, one should really develop engineering skills. And I think this is why many of you, I suppose, read my blog, because I try to incorporate the engineering skills into what I talk about FEA. Because it's one thing to you know press calculate and get outcomes, and it's the other thing completely to understand what you are doing. And this understanding is something that is, that is really important. So, in becoming an FEA analyst, I would definitely strongly focus on engineering skills. That's that's like the, the big part. You, you need to understand not only how to support your model, but why do you want to support your model this way? And is it even correct? Something like that, right? So the second part would be FEA is definitely about knowledge, not about gear nor software. I remember when I bought my first decent car, uh, a friend of mine approached me and said, like, look, Lukas, I know you quite well. So I will straight it, straight, I will tell you this straight. Uh, a good car doesn't make you a good driver. So be very careful when you drive this one. And he was true on so many levels. Like, 
if you can, if you have access to like you know the best grade FEA software, and you're like you know average in what you do, you will get average outcomes. But if you find someone who is very good at engineering and he understands what he tries to do, he will do it regardless of what software he has access to. Sure, some things are simply unsolvable in some programs. Because simply put, like there are no things you can implement. Like if you, if your FEA software only operates with beam elements, there is no way you will calculate the pressure vessel. Like you need shells to do that, right? And if it's not there, then it's not there. But right now, there are so many good free solutions available, like Codaster, for instance, that you can download, and it's there, right? That I would say that the knowledge of how things work and what you want to do is much more important than what you have access to. And when I was starting in my first company, uh, we actually used Airfem. And right now, Airfem doesn't support several things that I consider necessary in the work that I do. So definitely I can say, yep, Airfem right now is too weak for me because I, I use Nastron at this point. But also I know that if someone would steal my license for whatever reason, I would still be able to do designs with Airfem. Okay, it will take more time. It may be frustrating from time to time, and maybe I will have to do like few estimates instead of having an accurate answer, but I would still be able to do everything that I'm doing right now. But does it mean that you instantly have to buy a super expensive solver? No, not necessarily. Like I would say that get whatever you can have, and many open source FEA are out there, so it's not a big deal. And until you can explain to someone else why the software you are using is too weak for your skill level, it's okay. Like, I literally changed using Airfem for Nastron because I knew precisely that Nastron has those capa capabilities, Airfem didn't. And I could say, okay, in this model, this would be better, in that model, that would be better. I already understood why I want to use it. So then it made sense. But many people don't start with FEA because they say, oh, the software is too expensive and I will never get enough to, to actually start. And that's not the case. Like I always earn money on FEA work and I save this money to buy better software, to do better work, to earn more money, to buy better software, more or less. And it's absolutely doable, especially since you don't need to have an office when you want to start your business. All you need is some skill. And even if you work in a company, convincing your manager or whoever supervises your work to, to buy a relatively cheap FEA solution or maybe use even the free solution to, from time to time, start analyzing different things more accurately shouldn't be too difficult, I hope. And this is how I started. I, I did like big models of big structures, like normal structural steel beam element models. And then I would make like a small section with single connection just to see if, if it will work because I wasn't sure of this or that or whatever. And in time, the models become, become more sophisticated. You understand more. And it only comes uh, with practice. So definitely, uh, while it's awesome to have a super good computer and a very good license, it's not as needed as knowledge you need to have about what you want to do. So when you're starting, I would start thinking about what I understand and what I should understand more to be good at thinking about solving engineering problems in general, even not in relation to FEA. It's just a calculator in some sense, right? So the most important part in FEA is also software independent. And this is what people are really confused about when they talk with me about training. Like they say, like, do you do training in ANSYS? I was like, no, I do training in FEA. That's that's a different type of work, right? So when you want to start, um, you really want to think about how to model something, how to use it in future, and uh, what, what are you trying to solve? That's the big and important part of it. And it's not how to do it in any given software. I mean, come on, we have YouTube, right? Oh, we're on YouTube, hey. Uh, and you can actually type, you know, how to connect two lines in ANSYS using whatever tool, right? And I'm pretty cer certain that there is a company who sells ANSYS and they have like a beautiful three-minute video tutorial on how to click where to achieve something. 
The problem is that you cannot search for this video if you don't know what you want to achieve, right? So understanding what you want to do is far more important than actually knowing where to click. You can, you can always ask your so software provider where to click for something, but it's hard to actually call someone and say, hey, you know, I want to design a silo. How can I do that? <laughs> That's like, there is no answer. But if you say, I'm designing a silo and I don't know how to connect this with that, it's easy. They will tell you straight out, click here, it's done. Right? So focus on the things that are software independent. And while knowing software is cool, I mean, like when I started using FEMAP, I hated it to the bones. <laughs> like FEMAP was so not intuitive for me that I hated working with it. After several years, I actually learned to enjoy it. And it's fun. Like, you know, I know the capabilities a bit. I know where to click to get something. So it's working and it's fun. However, does, it, does this mean that my FEMAP knowledge is the cornerstone? Definitely not. Like, it makes my work more enjoyable, but you get those skills in time anyway. Like, you don't have to extra learn from it. Uh, I admit that from time to time we do have a training of some sort with FEMAP to, you know, click more efficiently, let's say. But I never consider this um, to be the cornerstone of uh, of uh, what I know. So what do you need to know? What to focus on to begin with? Uh, I would say that the biggest issue I have, and I've been doing training in corporations for like several years, and I, I train hundreds of people already. Without a doubt, the biggest issue people have is supporting the models. And like, it's not that they don't know that they, they should support the model. Usually they support the model in such a weird way that it makes the outcome stupid. And I've seen so many bizarre mistakes that it's sometimes hard to believe and also scary to think about. So supporting models is an art in some sense. And also this is an often neglected part of FEA because you know you, you supported the model and you press calculate, the outcomes are there, how to analyze the outcomes, right? The, and it's also when, like when you write a book, it's, it's kind of hard to explain how you wish to support your model because it depends on examples, so you should have videos, and most people learn from books anyway. So uh, supporting models is a big issue. Uh, and I admit that I usually tested it on several uh, wooden bricks from my kids, like, you know, the toys when you build block with wooden blocks, and I would set a few of them and look how it behaves, where it moves, where it doesn't, something like that, to understand how the model will behave. If you can understand it, then the rest is much easier. Also, you should know basic meshing, but I really mean basic to the point that when I finished my PhD, and, and I have it, I still didn't know that I used quad four elements. I knew that element size played a role in, in outcomes, and I knew that I should have smaller rather than bigger, but like that's that. <laughs> so if someone proposed to you, oh, you should need read about shape functions and everything else, like sure, at some level, this is really useful stuff. But I, I did several years in my career designing stuff, understanding this on a very basic level, mostly because I could look at outcomes and say like, hey, this makes no sense. And again, we get back to understanding the basics, right? The engineering part. Like I knew what I was expecting more or less. So if mesh really spoiled the outcomes in any reasonable way, I would simply realize that thanks to the fact that I more or less knew what I wanted to get. And I said like, okay, maybe we should make a smaller mesh. And then when you realize like the fact that you now know, because I just said it, that making a smaller mesh can change outcomes, it's already almost as much as you need to know, because if you're not sure, just make smaller mesh and see if the outcomes change. If you're not sure again, make smaller mesh. And you know, after two, three iterations, you know that, okay, the outcome is not changing very much, so it's fine. And then that's basically it. And after a few projects, you look at it as like, ah, I will do the mesh as always. And you just get the feeling of what is needed. Of course, one could say, yeah, sure, but there are like uh, stress singularities. There, there is a lot there, and I, I completely agree. But if you have the engineering knowledge, you also know that many of those problems can be, in many cases, safely ignored, and or you will do just nonlinear analysis, which is also a good solution to the problem. So I wouldn't go very deep into the mathematics of it, 
just the general sense of what I want to accomplish and how I want to do it. So that that would be uh, the second part. The third part would be loading. So how to load the structure? Because however obvious this may sound, it's not as obvious as if you, as you would think. Um, because sometimes if you put a crate on something that will deflect, uh, you don't get a nice evenly distributed area load. Uh, it's more complex than that. And the more detailed FEA analysis you do, the more this will play a role in your outcomes. So again, if you understand what you want to achieve, you're more or less set and loading isn't really that big. And then analyzing outcomes. Uh, is also important. So you need to understand what are the different stresses, which direction they go, why they appear, and so on and so forth. This is, again, not even related to FEA. Like, this is strength of materials, like what, third, fourth lecture of the first semester, stress types? So that's basically, you need to have a relatively decent uh, fundamental, fundamental knowledge about engineering, and that's enough. And if, if you have that, you will be able to analyze outcomes. And again, like there is a multitude of problems. Like, can I allow stresses higher than yield and whatever? Like, there is a lot. But if you understand the basics, you're set. So, when I did what I did and what I would encourage you to do when you, if you want to start in FEA, I simply did the design I did anyway because I know how. Like to me, that was steel structures. And every time I did a hand calculations of a connection in a steel structure and you know there are codes for it this is very well described in a book designing a bolted or welded connection in fea uh, sorry in with hand calculations is simple like th those are really the, the very first uh, projects you get uh, when you start studying steel structures right so i was certain that the design i did is correct i simply knew that from university so i would design something by hand and then model it in FEA and simply see what I get. And you see at that, you look at your calculations and, and you think, okay, if such is such a difference reasonable, maybe the hand calculations are uh, too crude. Like maybe this is a more complex case or maybe my FEA model sucks and I need to change something. And I feel that with that, you get a certain feel that what you do makes sense. And this feeling is a huge part of being successful in FEA, to be convinced that if you model something, it will make sense. Because if you don't believe in your skill in solving stuff, you will be afraid to use the skills. And if you want to use them, you won't develop them. So starting with something you know the outcome of. Heck, in the very worst scenario, you can destroy household items, like, you know, um, the things kids use to draw straight lines, they, they are made from plastic. You can break one, measure the load with how much water it was in a cup or whatever, and, and then you can try to emulate something like that in FEA. This is actually far more difficult than calculating a, a bolted connection in steel structure. So if you know how to design something by hand, Designing it by hand as you was taught at university and then doing FEA is way easier than, than the, you know, damaging household items, mostly because uh, very quickly you get into nonlinear realm of things because they break in a nonlinear way most of the time. And that would be actually pretty difficult. So I would consider this like a second step. And to sum it up, uh, learning FEA took me the core of it at least, like five years more or less. Now I am working with FEA like for 10 at least. And this includes the time that I did my PhD. So, and I'm still learning. Like I still get surprised. I learned a lot in like last year. And it's funny because you don't even notice that. You think like, oh, I'm stopped learning. We're doing all the same things all the time. And then you open like an old project from three years ago and you're like, whoa. <laughs> so a good advice, never open your old projects. It's, it's unhealthy. Uh, so. Learning FEA is a process, but I consider this to be an advantage because the more difficult thing it is to learn, uh, the less people will do it. So there is little competition and you can believe me or not, but really the, well, like where you're good enough in FEA, 
um, there, there aren't all that many people who are, or at, at publicly, let's say. So uh, when a customer searches for someone who's like very good in a field, um, you would be surprised how few options they have. Uh, and of course, you won't be an expert in any field. Like you, you will be expert in one if you're happy, uh, maybe two. And then, of course, after a decade in any other, you will develop skills. But still, uh, there aren't a lot of people who develop this level of expertise because it would require effort. And I consider this to be a positive because every time you learn and every time you develop, it actually makes sense. It helps you to stay relevant and, and get a good job. So um, those would be the pointers uh, I would give you to you know, start an FEA career. Um, definitely start with something easy. If you can design something by hand, design something by hand, get a hold of whatever FEA system you can have hold of, and try to design the same thing with FEA, compare outcomes, think about them, see what happens if you change the support, change the loads, change how the model is meshed. And if you just fool around randomly doing that, you would be surprised how much you will learn in a year or two. And this is how I started. Like, literally, this is what I did. And uh, it served me well. So I would definitely, definitely encourage you to do something like that. Of course, um, it never occurred to me when I started PhD to actually search for help. Uh, I just went to my older colleagues at the university to ask around how to do shell buckling in FEA. And, um, well, I was the only guy doing shell buckling in FEA, so nobody did that before in my faculty. So they just told me like, ah, oh, it should be easy, just do it. And um, it didn't occur to me to you know, search for online stuff. Of course, you're watching me here, so obviously you know that I exist. And I have a blog, so you can learn a lot there. And if you like, I also have an FEA course. And it would be a nice start. And I did it mostly because I would kill for such a course 10 years ago. And it would definitely save me a few years of random running around circles doing stuff. But if you're interested, of course, by all means, uh, if I manage to do it correctly, and I'm an absolute marketing guru, so if that's not the case, you can email me. There should be a link to the course in the description of this video, and I don't see it now, so I don't know. And there is also a nice discount code, FEA at home, uh, which will give you a 30% discount just because you're here. That's cool. So if you're interested in, in my course, great. If not, uh, I still really cheer you on. And regardless if you go with my course or not, uh, I would really encourage you to learn FEA. And I never regretted it. At some point, I actually left a company that I founded with two of my colleagues to start enter FEA because I wanted to purely do FEA and I couldn't convince my business partners to go there. So this was one of the best moves I ever did. Even though leaving my own company was pretty hard, I never regretted it because right now I get to do this and, uh, and it's cool. And if, if that would be something that interests you, uh, I, I cheer you on really. And, and I really hope that you'll find a grit to, uh, to learn it because it's really worth, worth it. And um, I couldn't imagine any other job I would be doing right now. So uh, definitely. Uh, definitely try that. So uh, that's more or less what I wanted to tell you guys. Uh, I, I hope that you enjoyed it. And um, while I was speaking, I saw that like the chat was rolling, but uh, I really don't have a split attention, so I couldn't talk and read at the same time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure how to approach the questions because to be honest, I was expecting like 10 people and two questions. So <laughs> like, I will try to scroll through the chat and simply starting from the bottom, no, starting from the top going down because starting from the bottom uh, would be would be difficult, right? Uh, because you will add new questions later on. So I will try to scroll and quickly read and, and you know give answers to everything. Uh, if you have answers to me, if you could start them with three question marks, that would really make it easier because scrolling, I will see, oh, three questions mark, three questions marks. This is a question. So it will be easier to find it. And uh, I will try to, you know, as quickly as I can, ask all of your questions and we'll see where this goes. Also, several of my subscribers told me that they couldn't come and I have like three pages of questions they sent me. So we'll see because I would rather keep it like, you know, under an hour. So let's go. 
uh, Oscar asks, what do you think about meshless methods? Uh, looks like in future there will be a single profile who will be able to design and calculate. How does this affect FEA analysis? Uh, more competition. Okay, I'm not very scared about meshless methods, mostly because I have a friend who works in Korea and some time ago, he reached out to me and said, hey, my company uh, developed a new meshless uh, solver. Would you be willing to test it and you know write something and, uh, and see if it makes sense? Uh, and meshless methods are great if you have like a huge solid bulky thing and you want to get a basic stress out of it. But if you calculate like thin plate structures and there is stability involved, eh, it's undoable. Sure, like in 50 years, maybe there will be like artificial intelligence solving every problem of humankind, right? Sure, that, that's a possibility, I guess. I'm not a futurist, really. I, it doesn't, like, I don't worry about things like that. However, knowing how many decisions I have to make based on my own experience every day, I'm rather relaxed. Like, if we, did, if we develop an AI that will be able to answer those questions, like, most jobs will be useless. So it will be a completely different world. For now, I'm, I'm not very... I'm not very worried about it. Uh, okay, Diego asks, I have a question. Do you see a PhD as important step to work uh, or become mastering in FEA? Um, yeah, uh, well, okay. My FEA didn't teach me how to do FEA, my PhD. Like, I, I had to do PhD. Uh, sorry, oh my God, I'm, I'm tired, sorry. I had to do FEA in my PhD. My tutor came to me and said, like, Lukas, this is a PhD thesis, so you have to do FEA. So, you know, do it. The first instant, the first thought I had was like, holy crap, so many matrices. Like, I don't, like, I know, I'm very poor at mathematics, like differential equations and stuff. Like, I'm, I'm not the guy. So I was like really thinking about it from a theoretical perspective. What PhD did for me is it forced me to stay day in and day out doing FEA. So I actually had to figure it out. Uh, many months later, I realized that shell stability is actually like pretty damn difficult. And for that time, I felt like an idiot because I couldn't solve any single problem, not really knowing that this is actually pretty difficult. So FEA forced me to learn. Yes, that's that's definitely the case. And the second part was I did experimental studies. And back then, it wouldn't occur to me to search in scientific literature to other people who did studies. The good thing is, if you do a laboratory test and you know how something fails, you can try to model this in FEA. And if you manage to do a model that nicely corresponds in failure between the test you saw and the model you did, you get super confident in your outcomes. And I did that several times in my career, also commercially, that I had to model a failure mechanism of some sort. And then they did tests and it matched nicely. So as I said before, having this confidence that you can solve stuff is super cool. And PhD doesn't help you with that at all. But sometimes, and not every PhD does, of course. Sometimes you will do laboratory tests. And having the outcomes there, being there, seeing that, uh, allows you to later do experiments. And frankly, I, I, I try to calculate my models from PhD after I finished my PhD. So I didn't have to do that. It was unnecessary, but it really helped. So yeah, uh, having access to laboratory experiments help, but you don't have to do PhD. All you have, all you need is to find like few scientific articles in the field that interests you and describe the test the authors did. That's just good enough. And uh, you don't get several professors yell at you for a few years. So that's a benefit. But um, I'm very happy I did PhD. Also, if you plan to have your own business, especially in like expert field of, PA, of uh, FEA, having a PhD helps. Like, you know, you look more serious and stuff. So from marketing standpoint, this also uh, makes sense. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. Now this is the part when when everybody say hi. Okay. Um, how do you educate your clients on what is good FEA versus the many many SolidWorks AutoTet measure experts out there? Um, I'm lucky enough that my customers mostly know that. Like. They already did have several experts in TetMesh that told them this or that. And, and then when you fix the first problem, they already know that you know this stuff. 
And okay, running a blog helps. I'm to be absolutely honest, I don't know if my customers read my blog. Like if, if I send a proposal, do they go to my website and check that I know what I'm talking about? Like it's unmeasurable. I, I, I just don't know. Uh, I admit that I have several posts that I linked to, to some of my customers before, uh, just to, um, to let, set, tell them, look, uh, it's a long discussion, just, just read this and it will be fine. But I rarely do that. So, um, I usually just say, look, I can I can solve it. Like there are experiments I did uh, in lab and then do FEA models and I have a one-on-one -on -one correlation. I know what I'm doing. I, I can do that. And uh, I don't like going into discussion as, oh, who did you this FEA project before? Oh, that's so bad. Because nobody likes people like that, right? It's like a typical house renovation. Like whoever straightened the plaster on the walls, when the painter comes, will say, whoa, who did this? It's awful, right? Nobody likes hearing that. So saying them, look, you were so stupid two years ago to hire someone who did this crappy FEA, um, that's not my style. Uh, even though I admit that in one company, I asked them for like a typical report, just so I know what their standard is. And I kind of like send them a list of 20 things that were wrong in that report. So. I, like, I, I was learning. They, they were telling me how stuff should be done uh, in, in the industry because I switched. And uh, I simply wasn't sure if I'm stupid or there are mistakes. And so happens that there were mistakes there. So it sometimes happen, but I try to avoid this. I don't like critique other people. So I just talk about my strengths and what I do. I, I don't compare with others. Um, okay, Rob asks, do you consider yourself an expert in your field of civil engineering before you became an FEA expert? Ah, and did you start doing FEA in that field first? Um, expert is a big word, even though I'm using it. And like, you know, it's funny because I, I'm like, what, 36 now? So I, like anybody 36 shouldn't be called an expert in any field, right? Like I'm too young. I don't have enough experience to call myself an expert. But on another hand, like uh, every kid with uh, three months of experience is suddenly an expert in one field or another in our current day and age. So I guess that my 10 years of experience and a PhD make me an expert in what I do. Let's call it this way. Um, so yeah, I was very good at designing steel structures. Yes. W was I an expert back then? Let's just say I was very good. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious. Like there were still things I didn't know. And yes, I started FEA in that field first, mostly because the fact that I was very good allowed me to do hand calculations and understand what the expectation of outcome was. And then when I started FEA, I could see, okay, those outcomes make sense. They didn't make sense. And you know, with PhD, I just deepened the knowledge in one part of what I was doing and, and then build on that. And right now, I would say that I'm a bigger FEA expert than any particular field expert, but it's enough. Like, if you're good in a field and an expert in FEA, that's absolutely fine. I just wouldn't start with the expert in FEA because it's very hard to build expertise around nothing. Like, you need to build an expertise around something. Okay, uh, Ravi asks, what is the minimal qualification you consider to handle FEA staff? Undergraduate, postgraduate, or must have PhD? No, come on, like, uh, I'm not, <laughs> even though I, I was an academic teacher for 10 years, I'm the first one to say that if you have masters in any field, this doesn't mean you know anything. And I speak that because I was in a committee that did the thesis defense. I was the guy asking questions, right? And I did it for many years. So I'm absolutely sure that if you did a postgraduate or, or like master's, um, it doesn't mean that you know a thing. Like it doesn't even mean you can add to something like at some universities, of course. But on the other hand, there are students who on their second year knew so much about stuff that it was mind boggling. Like you could spot the guy or a girl on a corridor from like 20 meters off, like, you know, on a room with 200 people, I instantly know this person, that person, and this guy, they know what they're doing. And they didn't have any masters. They just were interested in this thing. They wanted to learn and they spared, spent their spare time learning. And you could really tell that. So it's not a title thing. Like, I know several guys who have PhD who wouldn't be very good at doing FEA. Um, so, no, I'm not, I'm not a big guy with titles, even though the world, the industry, 
uh, tends to like working with people with you know good education because this rises status and stuff. So having a PhD when you have a company is definitely a good idea, but it's not the qualification. Uh, I, I think that it's about knowledge, not the certificate. The, the diploma of university doesn't make you a smart person. Okay, so Eric asks, when you start a model, how do you define some benchmark to determine that your results are reliable? Uh, oh, Eric, that's uh, such a great question. Mm, when I start, let's say that I really have a dream to design something for a plane, something for a ship, and something that goes to space in my career. So let's say that I will design something for the ship now. This is the first time me doing that. And I never, like, I was once on a ship. I don't know if it counts. It, it was a big ship. Uh, so what I would do is, like, I would do the FEA. And without any real expectation, apart from the fact that I've been doing FEA for 10 years, and I simply expect what the outcomes will be, right? I know that when I will look at the outcomes, it will either click or not for me. But since I'm doing ship design and I never did, my experience is, okay, it's still helping me because I, I understand stresses, I understand how FEA work and stuff like that. So uh, it, it's hard, I, I don't really know how I did it at the beginning because it was like, you know, a decade ago, but I would think that I would do the FEA, then try smaller mesh, twice smaller mesh to see if the different, uh, if I get different outcomes. And then I would try to find someone who's very good at ship design, not necessarily FEA, and show them the graphs and say like, look, does it make sense to you? Like, and I, I would be willing to pay them if that's the case, or, or you would be surprised how many people would gladly talk to you. Uh, so uh, that would be one. But also I strongly think that when you start, th this is the biggest problem when you start with it. So at the beginning of your career, try to model something you can calculate by hand. Then do the hand calculations first, think them through, and write, yep, I'm believing in those. Because you would be surprised how easy it is to convince yourself that the FEA outcomes you did are good. So if you have pre-written calculations that show that something is off, this really helps. So if you can't calculate something by hand, like even if it's like, you know, a simple bending in a beam and, you know, that there is like a bending room and section module stuff like that, uh, if you can model this uh, and know the answer, then when you get an FEA, you know, like, okay, a few percent difference, there is always some difference, right? And, and you should be happy with that. So this is how I would approach that. Uh, okay. Uh, verification and or validation, do you recommend to carry them out? Um, sure, like, what? Like I don't think anybody publicly would say otherwise, even though I would lie saying that uh, we do like super intense mesh convergence study on every model we do and stuff like that. If you're doing something for the 20th or 50th time, you just know what the outcomes will be. So you look at the model, yeah, what I expected, check. Right? Even though I admit that every design in my company, even though there are only three of us, goes for a second person, and that's usually me. So if someone, one of my employees finished the design, they send the models and report to me. I read everything. I check everything. Because it's very easy to make a stupid mistake, like you know, wrong input data or, or, or something like that. So, so I actually check this twice, and uh, I guess that's a good one. Because like... I caught many mistakes and it's not that, like everybody makes mistakes. Like I made mistakes just as well. Like it's only like if you have to input 10,000 numbers, at least one of them will be wrong, whatever you do, because you're just a human. So, so in that regard, yes, it would be lovely to be able to do like, you know, full scale test of every design I do. Holy moly. Like I would knew so much if we could do that, but let's be realistic. Like this won't happen anytime soon, right? Unless you have super lucky and work in an awesome company, in which case, kudos. Like that's that's great. Uh, okay. <laughs> Someone wrote that courses that I hated at the university are the most valuable ones. I guess you're referring to calculating the connections. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I lost when I, some, someone wrote something and I lost when I was. Uh, 
How do you deal with material characterization? Do you normally use standard properties or do you have a material database? Uh, I mostly do steel structures. So, you know, with the stainless steel, there's this funny curves and uh, I actually have a database that sorts this out. And when it comes to normal black steel, then I use standard values mostly because, um, because this is enough. Especially since when you do nonlinear FEA, you just measure strain. Uh, usually the, those are on the plastic plateau anyway, the acceptable ones, so it's fine. What do you recommend to have a good administration of the simulation, Antonio asks. Administration like who does what? Um, I'm using Trello in, um, in my company. And every new project has like 11 checkpoints, like we're doing the model, we're doing the meshing, we're doing the loading, we're doing the combination and stuff. And someone gets assigned to this, uh, to this particular project, and then they check off. Like I did this, I did that, and they move it from column to column. So I see which project is where, and of course there is like a, uh, like a date, due date. So, um, so this is how I do it. It's super easy. Trello is great for that because it's easy to separate the columns, right? Like geometry column. And you can move it to meshing column when the geometry is done, right? It's very easy to divide steps in a typical processes. So this is how I do it. And I would recommend Trello. It's free. I, yeah, I think it's free. So, so that would be cool. And, and it's easy to use as well, which is, which is a good one. Uh, someone asked if is it if my course is intermediate level FEA. Ah, uh, that's an impossible question because I get a feeling that whenever I I tell about talk about basics, many people would consider this expert level anyway. And I had a lot of people buying my course and then sending me emails saying something like, "Oh, you call it basics," and I was thinking that I was wasting wasting money and I learned so much. So it's only depend on what you. Uh, what you would call basic or intermediate or advanced. Uh, but uh, on average, I would be easily comfortable to, to call it this an intermediate FEA. Yeah, it's like from, from the very beginning, including the engineering concepts you need to understand and learn. And surprisingly, a lot of people learn there a lot uh, to, to how to you know support mesh your models and stuff. So yeah, sure, it, it could be listed. I wouldn't call it an advanced course though, because I'm, I'm working on an advanced course right now. So. But intermediate, yeah, by all means. <laughs> Edson wrote that my course is the best. Thank you, Edson. Uh, okay, wow, there are actually few people encouraging to buy my course. That's thank you. Uh, okay, Rob asks: Since machine learning methods and applications have been developed a lot, do you think FEA field can be highly automated? Uh, jeopardizing human jobs in that regard. Uh, I talked about it before. To some degree, yes, the very basics of it, by all means, like linear analysis of very simple elements. Sure, to some degree, like I wrote scripts that generated models and analyze, analyze simple outcomes before. So it's doable. However, the more advanced stuff, nah, I'm, I'm not worried. No. Uh. Oh, thank you, Simon. I, I'm very happy that you liked uh, my. Uh, uh, how important is CAD to learn FEA? Um, not really. I I mean I'm maybe happy to be working with plate structures, so it's 2D. And for many years, we started from scratch. You know, draw a line, draw a second line, make a rectangle, make a plate, make a second plate, make a shell, whatever. And we built it, our models from scratch in FEA Solver. Sure, it took a lot of time to do so before we learned the CAD tools to extrapolate meat surfaces and stuff like that. But it was still less than 10% of overall work. So, like, if you would be able to speed up your CAD work by 50%, you're gaining, like, 3% of FE speed from start to finish. So, it, I wouldn't consider it the critical part. It's far more important are things to understand. What is the best free FEA, FEA software for analysis? Um, I never used uh, Codaster. That's called Salome Mecca in Windows, I think. Uh, I never used it before, but I heard many good things about it. So if you would have to shoot for one, I would go this route. The problem is that it's like French mechanically 
translated to English. But if I would have to pick one, I would definitely go there. What do you think about integration of design and structural analysis in future? Are more mechanical design engineers also doing FEA? Uh, do I understand this question? What do you think about integration of what's this, what's the difference between design and structural analysis? I'm I'm not sure. Like perhaps this is like a language thing, and I cannot translate it in, into Polish back in my head. Uh, more mechanical design engineering doing FEA? Yeah, I would say that more mechanical engineers do the FEA than structural steel, for instance, engineers. Like in civil engineering in general, FEA is more or less starting, while in mechanical engineering, it's well known and used. Uh, okay. Uh, as an undergraduate in mechanical engineering, what could be first step to forward FEA? Um, first of all, if you're undergraduate engineering and you know how to design something, like very simple rod and whatever, find a free tool online that calculates FEA and try to do a hand calculation of this very simple piece and an FEA uh, calculation and compare outcomes. If you're an undergraduate, this means you are still at the university, right? If you get discrepancies, you can go to your tutors and ask, hey, I did this hand calculation, this FEA, there are differences, like what gives, right? So uh, being a student while starting to learn FEA is actually a pretty good uh, position because you have access to people who actually know how to design right. stuff, hopefully. Um, okay, I will be joining the graduate analyst entire industry, so I would be getting enough exposure to get expertise in FEA. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how entire industry works, but it also will strongly depend on the job you will get, I guess. Uh, however, wherever you work, if you're passionate enough to learn FEA, uh, and you don't mind doing this on evenings, and I admit I did that for many years. Uh, you can go home from work and whatever you do there, as long as it's designed, you can try to do the same thing in FEA. And if you manage to land consistent outcomes, uh, even if they don't pay you to get them, at some point you can go to your boss and say like, look, this is what I can do, this is what I can do, that is what I can do, and you're unstoppable at that. Okay. How important is calculus to learn FEA? Should we be an expert in calculus? Arian, no. <laughs> I couldn't solve a differential equation if my life depended on it. Um, okay, if you give me like internet connection and eight hours, I will most likely solve a simple one. But that's that. Like out of my head with pen and pencil, pen and pencil, I just give up. I don't even try. So it's absolutely important. There are way more important things. I mean, like, sure, it would be great to know how the solver operates and understand all the inner mathematical mechanics of it. But let's be real. Like, it will take you several years to, to learn that. Uh, I would rather learn how stuff works and how to design. What other skills would you recommend to complement FEA? Programming, design, machine learning. Machine learning, I, I, I know nothing in the field, so I won't comment. Design, definitely. If you know how to design something, this will greatly benefit your FEA in general. So absolutely, yes. Design design is a super skill to have. Uh, programming, well, I love programming. I actually program in several different languages. And I, from time to time, I do scripts and I like it. So, yeah, it's fun. But it's not, not needed. Like, if, if you never programmed before and you've, like, you have some one skill to gain, design skill is way better than programming. But if you know design skill and you're decent with FEA, programming definitely can help, especially if you have a company and you're building tools for your company to operate faster. Then, yeah. Uh, what do you recommend for new generations to motivate them to start learning FEA? Some get frustrated and they just give up. Whoa, man, like that's an impossible question. Like, how do I motivate my own kids? Like, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm not very, like, like even though I'm, I read a lot of books about that, I'm not really in, like, self-development coaching stuff. So motivate other people is tricky. All I can tell you is um, I learned FEA. It was hard. I spent months working nights after working full day shifts in my own company, uh, learning with trial and error. And I, could, I, could, I couldn't get outcomes for like weeks. So it was very frustrating experience. Somehow I, I am doing I admit that being a workaholic really helps. Um, and it's great. If you will endure, it will be great as well. And like, I love the lifestyle. I love uh, he having uh, uh, the job that I do. 
like the freedom, whether, whether it's, it's just wonderful to work in FEA. But, and I'm also happy that it's so difficult to start, to, to get this momentum going, because this means that there won't be a lot of competitors anytime soon. So if that's enough for you to give you strength to wake up early or go to sleep late to learn for a relatively long period of time, then that's awesome. <laughs> okay, the next one is that uh, Claire, who works here, uh, reminds me to water Stephen, which is the flat, the plant behind me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I will try to remember that. Um, what software do I use in my course? Um, yeah, it's an FEA course, not a software course. I'm using FEMAP and RFM mostly because I have li licenses, but like, I wouldn't even consider like a quarter of students using the same soft. Like most people use different softwares and, and it works because it's about FEA, not about the, the software. Uh, of course, it's if you're using FEMA, then you can download a free trial version to do the course. Uh, it's easier because you see on the screen when to click. So if you're very new to the software, uh, you know, finding where to click to draw a line takes a few minutes, but that's that. Apart from it, you won't have a lot of uh, do my course begin with very basics of FEA? Yes. Are you related with ANSYS discovery line? If you are, what do you think about this kind of programs? I have absolutely no idea what that is. Is it like the real-time stuff where, where you have a CAD model and it shows stress in real life and you move stuff and it colors? If that's the case, that's great. I really like the colors. Uh, but like, I'm not sure if that will be like super useful, but I definitely see this to be a tool that allows cut people to go deeper into FEA if they, you know, caught the bug and are like, oh, I love the colors, let's do more, and then the real FEA. I don't think it will be very useful in like serious design, but as a first estimate, perhaps. I, I never used it before, so I try not to comment on things I never did before. Um, yeah, thank you. I like my attitude as well. Are there any real good books, courses about development of engineering solutions in a practical way? For example, how to avoid stress concentration, how to solve mechanical problems and so on. Um, Valerio, I think that the inherited problems with the books is that you cannot have a video in a book. And um, to be fair, like it's it's very difficult to, to, to write a book. I, I was thinking about it sometime ago, as some of you might know. Um, it's very difficult to write a book on how to practically model a model because it would be much easier to talk to the camera while you're modeling and say what you're doing, right? Like imagine how, how you would have to describe it. And um, perhaps there's a way, um, and I'm just too dumb. Uh, Dominique is writing a book about FEA. Uh, I think someone mentioned it at the very beginning and uh, I have very high hopes for the book. So we'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. I want to learn dynamic simulations. Please suggest some websites. Um, I have like two blog posts on dynamic analysis, but apart from that, uh, I'm not sure. I, I rarely do like very complex dynamics, so uh, it's not really my field. How do you think an FEA specialist could work with the COVID scenario? Like, like I do. Like, you know, uh, I admit that I'm at my office, actually, because I have four small kids and at, at the flat and it's very near my home, so I can walk here. Because working with four kids at home is impossible. So if you're asking this part of the question and you have to stay home with four kids, you can't work whatever you do. Uh, but apart from it, like my entire company just have like company laptops with, you know, licensed dongle. And we held, held um, daily one or two hour uh, Zoom meeting where we talk about, I don't know, politics, uh, fitness, um, stupid memes just to you know, socialize and, and the rest, you just do the job as, as always. Like I, I really like to work from coffee shops. So I'm kind of used to work, not at the office. Of course, now coffee shops are closed and you cannot believe how suck, how this sucks. I, I really like the coffee. And especially since now I, I, I get the time to, to write content. I really like to write with a very good coffee. And when you, when you buy coffee to go, it, it kind of like, it's not the same after you arrive to go. Right, but uh, but it's a, absolutely first world problem. You you can easily work from your laptop. I, I could if if not for the kids, I could work from from home as well. Mm, okay, Luis asks, how do you think an FEA special? Oh, sorry, that was that. Okay, what is FEA? Then, what is the biggest use of transient or model analysis? Well, vibrations for model, I guess, and then of course like enforced vibrations and stuff. Like this is not exactly what I do in my work, but 
I would consider bridges and, and other like civil stuff, and of course machines and how the vibrations transmit from one part of an assembly line to another and, and stuff like that. There are lots of units. Fair is finite element analysis. Yep. Sir, when do you start FE class? I am interested in online class. Um, there should be a link below. It's it's an on demand. So when when you enroll, you can start whenever you like. Uh, I don't start it. You can just uh, you can just enroll to the course and start whenever you like. Uh, okay, Pedro, can you trust your mesh the first time you do that when you have enough experience, or do you need to refine it every model? No, every time I do something new, I would do a mesh refinement. But when I do that, I kind of like build in my head what the mesh should look like. And then if I'm uncertain in like any other application, I will do the refinement again. But usually I kind of have in my head how this is supposed to look like already. When I was starting, I did mesh refinement way more often than now, obviously. Now with the experience, I am trusting with my meshes more, even though, okay, from time to time, occasionally I would check that, but uh, I'm, I'm fine. I don't. I definitely don't. Don't refine it with everyone. That that would be too much work. It would long last too long. When do you start your FE class? Like it's on demand, as I told you. The how to perform revetting simulation and validation in ANSYS. Um, I never used ANSYS in my life, so I don't know. And I'm not sure what what revetting is. So uh, I don't know. Sadly, uh, but I I won't help you here. Uh, do I show when I have a singularity in my model or do I hide it? Um, I never lie in my reports. If I get an outcome, I always truthfully say this is the outcome. Uh, so I would never hide it. But then I almost always do non near FEA, so uh, singularities aren't a big issue. Those could be easily explained, of course. And I, I understand the question. There will be people not understanding what's going on. They see the stress scale and they start to freak out and stuff like that. Sure. This is why I love nonlinear FEA. Um, so, do you show the stresses above the yield limit? Um, yeah, like I rarely get those due to nonlinear FEA. But if I have like a weird stainless steel material that that doesn't have the the, the plastic, the flat plastic uh, plateau, but rather goes upward, um, then yeah, sure. How do you estimate the price of a project? Uh, Pedro, you would not believe. I guess it. <laughs> and I've been doing it the same for like 10 years now, so I'm kind of reliable at guessing. But I just print that whatever is there to be designed. I sit like this and I look at it for like 20, 50 minutes. And then I start to uh, see problems. I'm, I'm a very analytical person. Um, like luckily for me, I guess I, I see problems in designs very easily. So I would make a list of potential problems the design will have. I would call the customer and say, "Hey, hey, how how do you think about this? How will we solve that and whatever?" And someone at the very beginning asked me if I ever badmouth competition. No, but the questions that I ask because I know deeply understand how this will work. Usually, customers say something like, "Hey, nobody else asked those questions." So they know I am good at what I do because I ask and clarify those things. And when I talk with them, I kind of get a sense of how we'll cooperate, what they ex what what their expectations are. Because sometimes people say they want you know this huge analysis, while in fact they are not interested in it. So I try to more or less guess the the, the amount of work they need to, and if they have the budget, and then I just guess it. And in time, you, you, you become very efficient. I never do something like, oh, this will be 76 billable hours plus three meetings plus one trip. So that's uh, like this times that. No, this is, this is not how I do it. Uh, what do you think about learning FEA on GN, GNU license software like Salome Mac? Oh, GNU must mean like generally free open something, right? I, I, I cannot expand the, the, the shortcut there. Salome Mecca, definitely. Yeah, sure. Salome, like the problem with cheap software is like, sorry, cheap, uh, free software is some industries will consider them bad sort of software. Something like, oh, look at this poor kid. He did this design in like free software. Oh, that's that's so bad for him. Something like that. Uh, so I would say that Salome Mecca is the only one that you wouldn't be ashamed of using, I think. I, I like I never used it before, 
And of course, like if you have access only to the free software, like <laughs> this is the only have you, the only thing you have. So there, there is not the big choice you can make, right? And uh, with Salome Mecca, there is a chance that you will use it later on as well, because I think that the, the license allows you to use it commercially, right? Uh, so that would be uh, that would be nice, I think. Uh, definitely worth it. And if you have, like, also what I would add is if you're thinking strongly about an industry, I would talk with various people from that industry and ask what uh, software is very common and very popular in that industry. Because using the software everybody else is using, even if it's not the best software, has huge advantages because it opens you up to cooper cooperate with others. So that's also a thing. And I don't, I'm not sure which industry Salome Mecca is popular. I, I would assume like uh, Atom Power uh, because I think it's developed for that, but I, I'm not in that industry. So, so I'm guessing. Uh, Fernando says that quality of elements is of paramount importance, lengths and angles of elements for analysis. Well, quality of elements is important important, sure, like everything else, but I, I'm not sure if I agree with you, Fernando. If you if you have time, we can set up like a meeting and chat on, on Skype, maybe in your industry with your experience that's the case, and I would definitely love to learn that, but uh, I'm not sure if I would say that it's more important than like reasonably supporting your model using reasonable loads and proper type of analysis. Like, sure, if you have like extremely bad mesh, then it's easy to produce like really stupid outcomes. But if you have like a decent mesh, the difference between decent mesh and ultra great mesh, uh, I want it wouldn't be as big. Uh, huh, uh, when are you going to start the nonlinear analysis course? Man, I did like two lessons so far, so like few months. Like when I was when I did the first course, the, the one with the link with the uh, with the discount code, I said to my subscribers that I will finish it in three months. It took me two years. So uh, I'm very delicate when it comes to guessing how, <laughs> how much it will take. I have a good speed, though. I, I, I write content like every, every day for two hours. So, you know, it's piling up and I have the system set up and everything technically is working already. So that's cool. Uh, but still, like, it will be months, most, most likely. I, I, I wouldn't say less. Uh, there are some messages retracted. I don't know what that is. Uh, do you use Python to... Uh, pre- and post-process FEA in ANSYS inputs and outputs. Um, I used Python in Abacus when I did a PhD because my university has a like educational license of Abacus, so I use Python then. Uh, in FEMAP, I use uh, Visual Basic because it's integrated with FEMAP. So basically, use whatever language kind of works with, with the software. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, we're almost at the at the bottom. Nice. Um, I have a problem with penalty contact node to segment, can you tell me if I should capture the two contact force and stiffness to have a coding that? Wow, I, I really don't understand this question, Alin. If you could send me an email and describe it a bit more, maybe I will be able to help you. Okay. Um, uh, while dealing with steel structures, as you mentioned, do you consider the pre-stress generated during forming of those parts? Uh, no, I usually don't. Uh, this, this is covered in safety factors in Euro codes. Uh, I see what you mean, and that will be lovely, but I also feel that this would be extremely difficult to do. Like, it's so difficult, in fact, that it might be useless from a design perspective, because it would take you too much time to analyze something. Like, if you think about, um, okay, you have uh, 2,000 beams, in your model and all were hot rolled at some point and th there are those residual stresses there and all like how do you wish to incorporate that no it's not how it's done like uh, the, the design codes for steel structures basically have safety factors and part of it takes this into account uh, do you evaluate fatigue in your projects in some this depends like i always ask customers do you want to have the fatigue done or not some want uh, some do and and, and then i uh, what do you think about seismic analysis using FEA for a beginner at undergraduate level? Uh, I'm very def I'm, it's very difficult to me to speak for like what is the undergraduate level because I was teaching international students at my university when I was a lecturer there. And I know there are a huge differences in what students know after undergraduate program on the various 
and not not only universities but even countries right so i don't know what you know a seismic analysis is pretty tough like if you want to have like enforced vibrations and and stuff like that it's to me that would be a complex analysis i would rather start with static if i would have to advise uh, is fea helpful in doing ffs i don't know what that is for in service assessed like corded vessel creep damage cracks yes definitely people use it i don't use creep models uh, cracks and damaged stuff mostly because i like i assume that this is connected with ffs this is not what i do but i know i know people who do that so so yeah what are the steps to get statically correct design with accordance to euronorm well first of all you need to make a model uh, you need to support it in a reasonable way and the code doesn't say how you should you should support your model. You're a designer, so you should know how. Uh, then you should load it. And the code, like there are very many codes on how to load the model. By this, I mean what the loads are. Like the wind load is this big, the snow load is that big, and so on. And then you need to, of course, properly introduce that to your model. And um, there are a lot of procedures in Eurocode how to design stuff. There are even software like Airfem that I'm using that has Eurocode procedures integrated which means that you click on a beam and say, calculate it according to Eurocode, and it's like, blue and measure all the equations. Because if I would have to calculate a beam structure according to Eurocode with FEMAP, I will cry blood, literally. Like with any more than 10 beams, like there would be so much work that I would have to actually write a plugin to FEMAP that does that automatically, because otherwise it would be too depressing. So um, when you talk about beam structures, it's definitely better to have um, a software that actually does beam design according to Eurocode automatically. This would speed you up tremendously. Uh, when you're talking about plate structures or shell structures, uh, you wish to see 1993-1-5, um, that's a number of an or of the code, and then 1993-1-6. This is for plates and shells, respectively. Those norms describe how you should do that. And they are also working on an FEA Euro code, like a separate norm for standardizing FEA design, but it's very short and not very detailed. So I'm not sure how much that would, um, uh, that would help. Uh, how good is Autodesk Inventor FEA? I don't know. I never use it. I trained a company once that used it, and I think that it had nonlinear capacity if you buy it, and it uses Nay Nastron, which is now called Autodesk Nastron, I think. So it would be decent. It's more or less about your skills in using it. Okay. Uh, yeah, when I start the fee class, it's on demand. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, Dominic wrote that learning FEA has nothing to do with learning software. It's about learning modeling techniques and stuff. Yeah, and definitely not only modeling techniques, but also how to support your model, how to load it, how it works. That's uh, that's that's cool. Do you have to have a PE license to set your own FEA company? What's a PE? Like, um, I have a company. I had a company even before I was a chartered engineer in Poland. In Poland, it works like that. If you want to be a civil engineer that uh, publicly designs stuff, you need to have um, an exam. And you can have it after a few years in the field. So the first thing I was, was to found a company and then we cooperate with people who had the license. So they verified and signed the, the, the projects we did. And then I, I, I made the exam to have my own stamp so I can do it myself. But no, in Poland, it's not very regulated. I can have my own FEA company, like a baker could have a uh, have a company. Oh, someone said that riveting is neat of onion. Okay, now I know what that is. Yeah, you, you could do riveting analysis in FEA, sure. Uh, what are my laptop specs? Um, it's uh, P73 Lenovo ThinkPad. It has 128 gigabytes of RAM, two fast hard drives, and four i7 night gen processor. My friend runs a like hardware store with computers, so he kind of helped me out here. Um, okay. How do I check welding in big models? Pedro, if I consider them to be important, I do it by hand mostly. I rarely do welding in FEA uh, for various reasons. I, I, prepare, I prefer to do it by, by hand calculations. Yeah, like Tony also asks about welding. Look, 
uh, with welding it's like this. If you want to build like a super neat um, 3D solid brick model of a weld because you are very concerned about fatigue, this will be a lot of work. It's doable. There is like International Institute of Welding recommendations on how to do that. Uh, also, if you want to do a fatigue analysis in uh, plates connected with welds, the same recommendations of International Institute of Welding would help you and will learn, teach you how to extrapolate stresses and how to calculate it, basically. So this is how I would approach it. If you want a normal stress analysis of a weld, I, I would rather either read the stresses from FEA and do hand calculations um, on those stresses, or if it's a big model, I would check what the bending moment is, what the normal force is, I would calculate the stresses in the uh, weld. Uh, it's relatively simple. And, uh, and then I would verify it according to the code. It's very difficult to assess the capacity of the weld with FEA in FEA because welding is a rather complex stuff. And when you have a lot of the welds in big models, the modeling is not worth it. So, so doing by hand calculations on the critical parts is okay. It's, it's important. But also since I come from a steel engineering field, I kind of know by a rule of thumb, which uh, welds should go where. So I don't verify I don't verify every weld that I do. What do I think the future of FEA industry is? Are there some possible application where simulation is not still not used? Uh, wow, Slavic, that's a pretty difficult question. I'm, I'm not very good at business, you know? Like, I'm, I'm good at what I do, and I run a company, and, you know, I'm likable. But on the same time, um, I don't like do market research and read about how businesses are developing and stuff. So I, I don't feel qualified enough to give you answers. Like, yes, definitely there are applications where simulation could be used and still is not used. Absolutely 100%. Can I name some? No. But I'm certain they are. Like, even look, even in civil engineering, when I started 10 years ago, not many people will do FEA at all. Like, people to this day use BIM programs with Eurocodes implemented. They, then, they still don't know they, use, they are using FEA, right? So definitely there are a lot of industries. But it will change. It will develop in a way that more people will be aware of the possibilities. And also more people will be aware of capabilities. So they, people will know that, okay, linear analysis is not exactly what we are after. We want a more detailed stuff because then our products will be more worth it and stuff like this. So I think that it will develop into more detailed design, I, I think. And also many more industries technically will be interested in that. But am I, am I even confident in what I'm saying? Like, as I told you, I don't analyze businesses, but since the last 10 years, I only see growth in uh, interest in FEA. And uh, maybe the, the, the interest in higher end uh, analysis comes with the fact that I actually know more so that's also helping you know, that I can apply for jobs that are more complex and I couldn't back then. So maybe the interest was always there, but I think it will develop even more. Mm. Yeah, what should be the laptop specs for meshing and FEA analysis for beginners? Well, there are no limits. You will, all, you will only long, wait longer for, for the analysis to compute. Right? I did like super high speed impact shell analysis on a laptop with four gigabytes of RAM. Like my cell phone has more now. So, so it's not a, like I wouldn't be worried about gear. Like, sure, it, it will be frustrating because, like, I when I press press calculate, I had to wait twenty hours for it to compute, and then it ends with an error, right? And you're very sad. But so if you do it like commercially, having a good, great computing machine helps because it speed ups the time you can deliver solutions to your customers. But uh, I wouldn't I I wouldn't over invest if you're beginning and doing this for fun. Uh, what is the future of FEA and what I think about meshless methods? I, I already talked about it. I, I don't think that meshless methods will very much impact how complex analysis are done. But if you're doing like very basic linear analysis, then they, they might be of use of some sort. Uh, Ranko asked why RFM was not enough for me in at least few years, they have developed additional modules for nonlinear analysis. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, Ranko, they did. Um, they don't have ArcLink method. Their algorithm for contact isn't great. So if you have contact and something will collapse in your model, 
RFM isn't the, the type of software. This is mostly what I do nowadays. So um, you can do a lot with RFM by all means. And it's a great software. Like, I still use it from time to time and I love it to the bone. It was like the first serious FEA engine that I had. And you know, I have a sentiment and also I use it uh, till today. But when it comes to complex plate analysis models, I think that Nastron is uh, more stable, more efficient, and with arc length and better contact, you can analyze more. Uh, okay, Jamie, how accurate do you think commercial FEA software are to design and model composite structures? Jamie, it's very hard to, for me to say, I would love to go get into composite structures at some point in my career. It's just not yet. So I, I haven't done a lot. I did only like one course on them. And um, I never did any studies. I didn't saw any uh, experimental tests. I didn't did no comparison. I, I just don't know. I would assume that with everything else, if you know what you're doing, you will be fine. But uh, yeah, at least this is my experience so far. Uh, do you consider internal stresses in steel structures, uh, initial stresses in steel structures? Well, this depends. If I want to invoke them by pre-stressing or something, yeah, by, by all means. But when it comes to rolling, uh, no, that would be too much work and safety factors take that. Oh, Eugenio, that's a great question. Eugenio asks how really needed FEA analysis in civil engineering. Uh, look, this depends. Um, to be honest, there are fields in civil engineering when you will never use FEA. Like if you design um, uh, single family homes, right? Like you, you can do it by hand or in a very simplistic way, right? So, and even if you would use FEA, you don't have to worry about meshing all that much and, and other stuff. Like, you will just buy a software that does this kind of design and you will be fine, more or less. Uh, when it comes to steel structures, this is my background, and even concrete structures. Well, well, with concrete, you quickly get into 2D elements, like plates, walls, stuff like that. Then it's good to understand meshing a bit because there is like a punching load from the column to the deck, and you need to know how small elements to have and how to model this region to avoid like punch through and, and, and effects like that. So it's good to be better with FEA. With steel structures even more, because steel is a wonderful material to work with, mostly because uh, you get a chance to do a lot of uh, uh, various simplifications and you can make your models more robust if you go into nonlinear material, nonlinear geometry, analyze complex stability. So then the more complex steel structures you do, the more you will use FEA. Uh, sharing methodology for fatigue evaluation for metals. Uh, sorry, that, that would take like another video at least. So so, so it's hard to, um, like the good idea, the, the, the rule of thumb is like make a model, mesh it reasonably, extrapolate stress to the weld, and when you know the stress, use the procedures from the code to calculate what's their fatigue life. Oh, someone asked which FEA software revealed their complete algorithm behind the solution. No clue. But I also know that if Nastron does it, I'm not even interested in reading it. Like, heck. It's like writing your own solver. Why would ever you do that? I, I would rather use the software to benchmark it against the solutions I know, like the experiments I did or experiments from literature. And maybe I will take a few scientific um, articles and see what people did there and try to reproduce the outcomes in my software. And if like I do like five or 10 benchmark models in a field I'm interested in and they work, the software works. Studying 20,000 pages of code to learn what exactly? Like, I, I don't know why why that would make any sense, apart from you want to spy on a company to, to write your own solver. Um, and if you are writing your own solver, man, you know so much more about it than I do. That's it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, thank you as well for coming. Uh, oh, look, I, I'm very happy that you liked it. Any advice on dynamic analysis? Uh, I know that dumping is a mess. I, I always wanted to learn more about dumping and I never got time because I rarely do dynamic analysis. So, so I would be very careful there. Um, yeah, when it comes to energy absorption, that's not exactly what, what I deal with. So, so sadly, I, I won't help you here. Uh, will I put the recording of this video? I think it will be automatically added to my YouTube channel. 
I hope, because I'm not recording it otherwise. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, it seems that's that. Uh, I had a wonderful time. I hope you did as well. If you did, that's great. Um, and like you know, there's there was so much interest that I actually think I'm doing this more often. And uh, I will definitely, um, definitely let you know when the next session is, will be. I even ordered a nice fancy microphone, so the next time or maybe two times. Uh, the audio should be better. So, um, awesome. Thank you all for coming here. I hope it, you, you had a blast. And I will appreciate the thumbs up, uh, liking the video and subscribing to my channel. And if you're interested in my course, you should find the link uh, and the discount code below. So, have a wonderful day. Stay safe in those crazy times. And see you around.